Hello my juicy co-creators, Lidu here. I'm today in Holland, in Dorn, still in the forest. I can't get enough of these conversations since you're too a speaker at the conference here. I had to pick your brain and that's exactly what you, you're you interested about. You're an author, a writer, a broadcaster. You wrote many, many books on the brain. Tell us why this interest in the brain. Why? Okay, I was writing about um, oh, all sorts of things, psychology a lot for women's magazines. Right, this is way, way back, like you know, 20 years ago, and I just got more and more interested in how we are. How do we come to be like we are? I mean, why do we do these things? It's really strange, and so I was reading more and more psychology, and then it was just at the time when they were getting these amazing machines, which um, allowed you to actually look inside the brain and see what the brain was mm. doing. You'd never been able to do that before. I mean, it was like all this time you've been looking at a kind of black box and what came out of it, but nobody had ever been able to lift the lid and look inside before. And then suddenly we had all these machines and you were getting pictures. I was starting to see these pictures in the newspapers and magazines of tiny little blurry images with a little kind of dot in the middle. And underneath it would say, this is where music is in the brain or this is where something is. I thought, what is this? Hey, hang on. I want to see, I want to, it all put together, you know. I don't want these separate little dots. I want to see how the brain works all together and there was no book you just couldn't get it nobody was writing I think part of it was that people were so excited with that work they were doing back then with those first imaging machines that nobody was bothering to sit down and tell you about it because like they just wanted to get on with the next experiment so nobody was writing about it and so eventually I thought I've got to write about it myself you know so I pulled together all the stuff I went to see everybody who was doing the work and got the experiments all together and put together which I think at that time this was sort of mid 90s was the first real I suppose beginning of an atlas of the brain showing where things were and how they related to one another and how out of all of that we got our behavior and our thoughts and our emotions and stuff and then it just kind of went on from there and since then I've written about personality, how that emerges out of the brain, and things like memory, and feelings and emotions. I mean, it all comes from the brain. Yeah. What are some of the most striking things you have found out about the brain throughout your research that you would like to share with us that can maybe even impact our, our life right now yeah. by knowing those maybe that we're, most of us are not aware of? Okay, one of the things that really interests me is what this conference is largely about, is about what is the self. We take it so much for granted that it's not a question that usually we even ask ourselves because it's just a given, you know, I'm me or you. And we don't usually think, well, what does that mean? You know, who am I? What am I? Now, I was really interested in memory how the brain lays down its memories and what we remember because it feels when we think about what we've done in the past that we have this perfect full memory but actually we don't now that was one thing I was looking at and then I started to think about the self and then I thought hang on let's put these two things together and see if that tells us anything and I was interested in some studies which were not really brain studies they were like psychological studies about memory like things like there's something called state dependent memory we're all familiar with this and what it means is that if you're doing one thing like you're at work and um, say you had to do something at work some kind of something on the computer right you can be really good at it at work then you go on a holiday for two weeks halfway through your holiday for some reason somebody says hey you know how to do this will you do it now there you are on a beach you're in a holiday mood you've got a whole different set of thoughts feelings emotions and stuff and you get this thing that you do every day at work and it's in front of you and suddenly you can't remember how to do it do you know that sort of feeling or you see somebody this is even more common someone that again you see every day at work right and then you see them somewhere where you never expected to see them and of course you know you know them but you just can't get their name even though they're really familiar I mean these sort of things are familiar to us all and we shrug and say oh out of context or whatever but if you look at that really closely say what's going on here and you realize what is happening in your head is that you are just going from one state to another 
and the states don't necessarily share the same memories. Mm. So whereas me holiday state might know, you know, everything about the coast and how to sail a boat, say, uh, it won't have the memories of like how to do the accounts or whatever I have to do when I'm me working state. Now, again, that kind of sounds really ordinary, but then when you think about how that might relate to the self, you start to recognize that the idea that we have of being a consistent self through time, which is the intuitive idea that we have, might not be correct. And that, in fact, if you look at me holiday me and me work me, it is not really correct to say that they're the same person because not only might we have completely different memories, but we would probably also have a whole different set of emotions feelings, um, perceptions, responses, moods, and what is a person if they are not the sum of their moods, feelings, perceptions, and particularly memory. And so through this, I started to develop the idea of multiple selves. And then I started to look, and this came out of a book I wrote uh, a way, way back about consciousness, looking at what was consciousness, what do we mean when we're conscious and really deep stuff. Um, but one of the things I thought, okay, how am I going to get a grip on this subject? What am I going to, you know, how do you start with consciousness? I thought, okay, maybe one way to do it is to look at people whose consciousness is obviously very different from normal. Like they've got fractured consciousness, you know, it's strange. And so I looked at things like schizophrenia, um, some of the am amnesic states where you don't know who you are, and the one that I became really interested in was um, its multiple personality disorder. It's usually called dissociative identity disorder, but it's the other title I prefer. It explains it better. And that is this amazing condition where you get people who will just go from one second to another to a completely different person. And it might be somebody with a different name, um, with a different uh, sex even, um, with a whole different history. So I don't know, a lot of people will have seen this on television because there have been quite a few people now um, who have been shown doing this. And I looked at that state and thought, hey, hang on, how can you get to that form of consciousness? What's it like to be inside there? And you realise what is happening is that the self is just switching. The only thing that is staying the same in those people is the body. And what I got really interested in then was that there were um, experiments then beginning where they were put, putting these people into uh, brain imaging machines, mm -hmm. like fMRI scanners, mm -hmm. and looking at what happened when they did these sort of switches from one cell to another. And what you would see is that a whole different part of the brain mm -hmm. would turn on. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, uh, that, you know, people say, oh, they're just acting, or they're just behaving that way. But something really physiologically, basically different about those people's brains. And then I sort of think, hang on, are they so different? Or going back to the state-dependent memory state, where you're slightly different when you're on holiday from when you're at work, I thought, maybe we're all a little bit like that. It's just a matter of degree. And so from that, I developed an idea. I call it multiplicity. Um, I wrote a book about that. Um, and it was really an examination of, of multiple selves. Really say, we're all multiples. There's no such thing as a single unitary self, even though it feels like it. So that's a particular interest. Anyway. <laughs> that's exciting. Oh, my goodness. I'm loving this conversation. And, and, and so what is our, what does that tell us about in our own life? How can we apply this? Well, I think to recognize that we respond very differently and become very different people in different situations is really crucial because I don't think that until we know and recognize that about ourselves that we can have any kind of control over it. The beginning of getting control is to recognize what happens and what triggers those changes and the people and to understand the different selves that you are. So, for example, 
I go mad in traffic jams. I just I just cannot be cool about it. Put me in a traffic jam. I go mad. It's not good. It's not good for me. It's not good for the other drivers. It's not good for the passengers. It's a bad thing. You know, I really don't want to be that person. But there's something about a traffic jam that just triggers it. And I don't feel any control. It's not a choice. I just become this really bad-tempered, aggressive person. And while I was looking into this, uh, one of the exercises I started to develop, and I tried them on myself first, obviously, was like to work out hey, what those people are, how they differ from one another, and then work out what triggers them. And that is just one little, quite trivial example of how once I recognized, hey, hang on, I'm just responding in a Pavlovian way. I, I'm just not really there. I'm just going into the state and I don't have to do that. I can instead overwrite that trigger with another one. I can say, here's a traffic jam and I am going to start meditating or listen to the radio or start rehearsing, you know, talk I'm giving or something instead. And if that becomes habitual so that traffic jam, instead of just triggering bad temper, triggers the secondary thought, right, now I start singing. Mm -hmm. In time, the trigger doesn't, it's not as automatic. And so you can start to get some control of yourselves mm -hmm. and be much more what you want to be instead of what you're just driven to be. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit about self-control. Yeah. Did you find out ways to actually get the full brain? A lot of people talk about the right atmosphere, the left atmosphere, how important it is to have them both working. In, in, in. Do, you, do you find techniques or things? And, and is it truly, uh, can we measure that? And when we see actually it makes us happier in life and uh, we have richer lives too? Well, there's been a, an awful lot of rubbish talked over the decades about left and right hemisphere. Actually, both sides of the brain are involved in everything and if you knock out one side you know, you're done you can't even speech which is one of the most clearly lateralized things everybody says speech is on the left and it's kind of true that articulation you is on the left and um, understand is on the left but on the other hand there's a whole lot of stuff about speech which is on the right but in everybody even the most sort of you know, lopsided people um, in like tone of voice and um, the way you express yourself and everything you can't speak properly without both sides of the brain or do anything else properly and I think once people started to see that again through imaging like they give somebody a task that was traditionally meant to be one side and see oh dear the whole brain's working there was a period until quite recently when like you couldn't discuss it it was sort of you know anyone who said left right brain oh it's rubbish that's rubbish that's folk psychology and everything else I'm glad to say that now that is um, starting to go away. People are going to starting to look at this lateralization thing again because there definitely is a difference between the two sides of your brain, and um, what the whether it's that it just becomes a habit or whether you're genetically inclined to use one side of the brain more than the other. People definitely do differ. So if you give two people the same task to do, some of them will process it much more with the left and some with the right. And as you suggest, of course, the perfect thing is to get them both working in harmony, doing what they're best at. Um, and I think you can probably exercise that a bit. You can, um, for example, It's fairly clear that the left side of the brain is better at doing things which require detailed action, like step by step, like you've got a plan, a methodical plan. And things can go badly awry if you've got your plan and you're really good at, you know, step one, step two, step three, but you forget to stand back at any stage and look at the whole thing. So you can get driven into doing stuff mm -hmm. where you don't really agree with what the end is. You don't really want to get to the end. You're just, you know, so close to it that all you can do is those little steps. And that, I think, is left brain activity. And you really want to get your right brain working on that, getting an overall view of everything, getting, you know, in a way back to back to basics. What do we want here? And I think that exercises, if you are aware that you're somebody who tends to think in detailed, plan, very methodical sort of ways. Um, and it might be that you'll need someone to tell you that, but I think people do tell you that, actually, if you're that bad. Um, you can start to kind of just write 
exercises for yourself, like stop, stop at least every, you know, third step and ask yourself this question, am I still on track? Is this the bigger thing I want to do? Um, do a little exercise about what's the purpose of the whole plan and keep doing that. And I think that way that you can probably train both sides and you know, a larger part of your brain to be brought to bear on any task. And that, I think, is what we recognise is, is what's really wanted, to bring as much of, of this whole amazing sort of apparatus mm. to bear on everything we're doing. Mm. What is your feeling about and your research regarding medicine and the impact of medicine on, on, on our brain? And also, to you, is there other techniques or other things that are emerging that would be more powerful uh, to heal and, and uh, from diseases yeah. than, 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 than taking those medicines on the, on the, from a brain standpoint? Yeah. I do think this is incredibly important today because we've, we've had wonderful drugs. I mean, until what, 40 years ago, if you were very depressed or very anxious, apart from a few folk remedies, you really uh, couldn't do much about it. I mean, yeah, always techniques like med meditation, but anybody who's tried to meditate and failed knows how difficult it is to do those mind techniques. And so a lot of people, I think, were suffering very badly. So I think, I say this because I don't want to give the impression I'm anti-drugs, because I think that things like antidepressants and anti-anxiety um, drugs have been wonderful. They've saved a, a lot of lives. They're terrific. But the trouble is... They have damaged a lot of them too. They've also damaged a lot of people. And that is the problem, that they are very powerful agents acting on an extraordinarily delicate and complicated mechanism which we don't understand by any means, our brain. And so you put a drug in there and it's not going to do just what we want it to do. No drug is going to do that in the whole body, though. even though we know certain mechanisms very well, but certainly in the brain. And everybody's brain is so different as well. So you, know, you take a drug, I take the same drug, you're fine, I'm not. Um, and so, so it had a counter effect on one person and not on the other, a second effect that is not desired? Absolutely. It seems to me my boggling that uh, some scientific... So we c that we can think that uh, um, um, we have we understand everything about the consequences of a medicine of a drug. How 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 can we really? I mean, can we be that intelligent? I don't think so. Sometimes it seems like it's it it can be done very quickly, like vaccines. And I know that's a whole other topic, mm -hmm. but uh, do we really know the impacts and it has on the brain? And well, no. Uh, you can't possibly. And the brain is just far too individual in every person and too complicated, I think, for us ever to understand. Um, having said that, I still think for a lot of people, they're much better than nothing. So I don't want to sound as though I'm against them. But yeah. what I do think that we are starting to have the ability to do, which is going to be really important in the future, is that as we get to know much more about the detailed function of each little bit of the brain, so the map, if you like, gets more and more detailed. We are going to be in a position, instead of having to go through drugs, you take a drug, goes into the bloodstream, it crosses the blood-brain barrier, and then if you are lucky, it starts to alter the particular bit of brain that you want to have more altered. Now that's a long and very tricky route to get some benefit and that's why you know it can go wrong at every point and so often does um, but what I think we're getting close to be able to do is to actually alter that brain function directly mm. um, as you know the brain is not just a chemical thing we tend to think about chemicals because there's so much said about um, serotonin dopamine and stuff but it's not just a chemical thing it's an electrical machine it is an electrical organ that's what nerve cells are. They work because they fire electrical charges. And um, so you can, if you look at it as an electrical machine, instead of trying to alter it chemically, which is always kind of going to be more complicated, you can think of just altering the electrical activity directly. Everybody shrieks, oh, <laughs> yeah, oh, no, electric shocks in the brain. I mean, it's just a knee-jerk reaction, no. But there are techniques coming up which are so gentle and so subtle that you can start to alter the way the brain works without even giving a charge that you, you would feel. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about sort of zapping the brain with huge electricity, so, yeah. um, but just 
the tiniest little micro trickle of electricity, too small to even feel, doesn't even tickle, has been shown to alter the activity of the cells underneath, not just in the moment, but long term, in such a way that they are more inclined to behave as you would want them to in a normal situation. So I'll just give you just one example of a recent um, study that was done in Oxford in England um, and London, I think it was a joint thing, um, where they gave people this tiny little trickle of electricity and they actually put it uh, there, actually, just there in the parietal cortex, a little bit, which is the bit that is responsible for doing maths. So if you add up two and two, if you were in an imp scanner, that bit of brain would light up. You'd see those neurons firing. Mm -hmm. Now, put very crudely, if you're really good at maths, they will be super duper neurons. There'll be lots of them. They'll, they'll all be very, you know, they'll spring up and then do their job very well. If, like me, you're absolutely lousy at maths, <laughs> essentially they'll be really kind of sluggish. They won't be connected very much and they don't get much practice because they don't like doing it and so on and so forth. Now, what they found was, was when they took people and put a really tiny, I can't emphasize how small this trickle of electricity is, through those brain cells, that the people um, became better right then and there in the laboratory. They became better at mathematics. Wow. And what was even more interesting by way of therapy for the future is that if that was done repeatedly, just in little sessions over a few days, those effects seemed to last so that they became permanently just a little bit better. At mathematics. Now that probably isn't an effect. I mean, there's a whole big debate which is yet to be had, uh, and just starting to be had about cognitive enhancement. Mm -hmm. If you can make people's brains better, should we do it? Mm. Should you know, or will you get parents who will, you know, be artificially enhancing their kids' brains so they win? You know, I mean, is it? It's it's a moral issue. It's an mm. ethical issue, mm -hmm. and that's still got to be done. I think first of all, what is much more interesting is the application of that sort of technology to things like depression, anxiety and it has been shown as well I mean to work in those conditions just as it did in the laboratory for make people better at maths it's been shown that it can tone down anxiety it can improve mood and they've, but they've, they seem to have abused of it a, a lot. I hear in uh, for people having big depression problem, they bring them in the hospital and and bring a big electroshock and and to 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 wake them up out of this state. And it been it's been misused. I mean, then they become like zombies and half dead. And it seems to kill cells rather than to then enhance the brain. We're talking there about two yeah. completely yeah. different things. Yeah. Um, but we need to clarify this because immediately our mind I brings... Know, yeah. And I don't know how... <laughs> I, I, I mean, the sort of electricity one is talking about and what I'm talking about, transcranial direct current stimulation, mm. it is so small you don't feel it. Right. It is so small it doesn't actually alter the immediate behaviour of the neurons. It doesn't make them active in the moment. What it does is very subtly alter just a molecule or two in the um, membrane of the cell with the result that it becomes a little more sensitive okay. next time it's asked to work. So it isn't, it's totally safe. Um, it's effectively the same as you might get if you really worked hard at practicing maths, right? You're having that sort of effect. But instead of having to sit down and like, you know, do mathematical problems, this is helping you to do it more easily. Uh -huh. So it's a way of just making the brain oiled, if you like, uh -huh. just a little bit better at doing what you want it to do. And it's just so, it's so, it's nothing to do with those horrible stories yes. of bad ECT, the old fashioned electro uh, uh, therapy where they used to have to give muscle reactors because people had fits. It's nothing to do with that. I'm talking about something else. What saddens me a little bit is that people don't wait to hear or they don't take take this in because, as you say, we think, oh, you know, electricity, get all scared and don't hear, <laughs> don't even take in the fact that it's completely different from that. And I think that that very fear, sadly, might hold up the development of this 
And I think that it could do so much towards um, taking away from pharmaceuticals. It could help so many people and avoid them having to take drugs in the long run. And Even things like uh, Alzheimer? Well, there are studies. I hesitate to say that because it's um, it's so the last thing you want to do ever is to give people any sort of false hope about that particular condition. But it is true that people are saying that they can see that it might well have an application in Alzheimer's because one of the things about Alzheimer's disease is that because the brain itself is becoming degenerated in all sorts of ways, um, that what you, even the healthy bits that are left, uh, w what this could do would be to enhance them. So that it wouldn't uh, cure the disease. It wouldn't stop the degeneration of the brain, but what it would mean would be that the bits that were left healthy would work better, so they would compensate. And we know in Alzheimer's disease that people who um, have really healthy brains so that the bits, again, which are left, um, keep working. They suffer far less. Uh, there was somebody, um, rather a well-known man in Oxford, who um, went to the doctor about his brain when he discovered he could no longer do four concurrent games of chess right <laughs> because he was used to doing six and when he found he could only play four boards at the same time he got worried when they actually um looked at him he was uh, sounds very sad um within months i think he was dead because actually he was in an advanced state of alzheimer's disease but because he was such an intelligent man if you like he had such a dense brain that he could lose 80 percent of it before in a way he was like the rest of us mm -hmm. if you know what i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it was an indication of if you can keep your brain really healthy what's left of it the effects of alzheimer's will be much less you know you you won't be affected so badly and this i think is probably a way of doing that in the long run but i don't think that's going to be what it's going to be useful first of all i think it will be first be used for things like depression anxiety um, stuff like tinnitus you know tinnitus where you have ringing in the ears oh, yes, 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 yes only generated sound it can drive people mad yes. you, you, can, you can't get away from it dreadful dreadful thing to have and that is caused by spontaneous activity in the neurons which is not triggered as it should be as it normally is by outside sound waves it just they just mm -hmm. keep going whether there's any incoming uh, stimuli at all that is definitely the sort of thing this could be used for just to calm those neurons down mm -hmm. so that they are less active and less likely to fire when there's no outside sound Did you find out through your studies that the brain could sh change shape and could uh, could could become bigger or just different shape with knowledge and with information and 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 as, as a person evolves too? Oh yeah, the internal structure of the brain. I mean, it doesn't actually on the outside um, change because there's no room to change. I mean, like it's in the skull. But if you look at the um, you know the through a microscope of what is happening in the brain. Um, What happens when you learn something is that the neurons actually become more densely connected. You get more connective tissue between them. So it literally gets more dense. The actual brain gets more dense as you learn stuff. It's a physical thing. Um, and yeah, you can see the difference. Um, plus, there is also, they're learning more and more about um, the actual birth of new brain cells. It used to be thought that that we were born with all the brain cells we would ever have, that isn't true. And then it was thought, oh, you only get new brain cells in a very particular bit of the brain. But now they're finding out, oh no, they seem to occur rather wider than we thought, but very particularly in the areas of the brain responsible for memory. And so, uh, undoubtedly, um, learning new stuff and um, avoiding the depths of, I mean, things like depression, for example, actually seem to inhibit this birth of new neurons, whereas really good mood mm -hmm. seems to, and learning new stuff, seems to encourage it. Yeah. So yeah, the brain changes depending on how you use it. Yeah. I've heard that, I've read once that the um, happiness 
can actually really help a person to cure much faster. Can you see it in the brain activities? Well, what happiness probably does, one of the things that it does undoubtedly is because the whole body, you know, the brain doesn't live separate from the rest of the body. It's all interconnected and there are very direct effects that the brain has on the hormonal system, the immune system. And so a brain that is working well is also going to help the rest of the body to do what it does properly. Mm. Yeah. So there's a, like a two-way, mm. you know, it's a circular sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, healthy brain and a healthy body, It's uh, it's uh, oh, that's been known for a very long time. Mm. You can't have one without the other, really. Mm. Beautiful. Is there something else that you want to add, you would like to add to this conversation, Rita? It was yeah, so good was being so with you. It was fabulously wide range. Yes, it's really great. Well, I've enjoyed myself yes, anyway. Me too. Thank you for sharing your brain out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I bet you've heard that more than once. Anyway, much love, my beautiful co creators from Holland. Next time I will be in Utrecht, I think, or in Amsterdam because some little interviews are bubbling up. We'll see. Oh, right. But thank you, Rita, very much for this moment. Good luck on the conference and everything that is coming up for you. Thank you. <laughs> much, much bye -bye. love. Bye.